Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to an educational presentation on voting methods co-sponsored by the Montana Wyoming Braver Angels Alliance, the Wyoming League of Women Voters, and the Wyoming Tribune Eagle newspaper. Uh, it's great to see such a large turnout for this event. All across the country, there's been an increasing interest in the voting methods by which our elected officials are chosen. Those of you from Wyoming may know that the Wyoming legislature is currently considering switching from a simple plurality method to a runoff method. And earlier this year, it rejected a ranked choice method. There are many more methods to choose from, however. And if you've taken the time to study voting methods, you'll understand how complicated the subject can be. So this afternoon, we're very fortunate to have two experts on voting methods explain what some of the more popular methods are and how they've been used and what criteria should be applied to determine what the best voting method might be in a particular electoral situation. The speakers will be introduced uh, a little later. I'm Tom Brantley, one of the Braver Angels Wyoming State Coordinators from Cheyenne. Our Zoom uh, participant manager is Janet Sedgley, the Montana Braver Angels Coordinator. Hello, glad you're here. And uh, Janet will introduce our first speaker, Dr. Cal Muniz. Janet will also be tonight's troubleshooter. So if you're having any technical issues, you can contact her. Uh, make a note of her phone number, which is in the chat at I think about 2.05 PM. And I'll explain the chat feature in a minute if you haven't figured that out already. I'd also like to introduce um, Chris Corfanta, the other Wyoming State Coordinator from Ranchester. Hi, everybody, welcome. Our Zoom feature manager is Fran Bunker from Sheridan, who is also on our Braver Angels Montana Wyoming Alliance Planning Committee. Went away, Fran. Hi, how are you? Good to see everybody. And Lindy Kirkbride from Meriden and Cheyenne uh, is also on our planning committee. From the League of Women Voters, we have the president of the Wyoming League. Nancy Lockwood. Nancy will introduce our second speaker, Matthew Link. Uh, Lynn Epina is the president of the Laramie League of Women Voters. And Robin Hill and Susan Simpson of the Laramie League, are they waiting? Um, will also be helping out this afternoon. And last, but certainly not least, is Brian Martin, the managing editor of the Wyoming Tribune Eagle newspaper in Cheyenne, and a very valuable member of Braver Angels. Thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, Brian's you. going to help with questions and a wrap up at the end of this afternoon's presentation. This meeting is being recorded and will be available to the public on the Wyoming Tribune Eagles YouTube channel. So anyone who does not want to appear on that should turn off their video. Uh, you should be able to do that by clicking on the, on the video button at the bottom left of your Zoom screen. If you don't see the menu bar, move your cursor to the bottom of the screen and it should pop up. If there's no video button there, you might be using a different version of Zoom. Look for the three dots in the upper right-hand corner of the box with your name uh, and video in it, and a stop video button should be in the drop down menu. If you stop your video, you'll still be able to see everything, you just won't appear in the video. I hope all of you received an email earlier today with SurveyMonkey in the address or in the subject line. If you didn't, please check your inbox and spam folder for that email. It has a link to voting ballots that will be used later on in an interactive demonstration on how different voting methods work. So please leave that email open so you can easily access it later on when you'll need the link. For those of you who are members of Braver Angels, and I hope all of you who aren't will want to join after today's event, this event is going to be a little different in several respects from what you're used to. In most Braver Angels event, the most common are the workshops and the debates, 
everyone participates or at least has the opportunity to participate. Everyone's views are equally important. For this event though, we are very fortunate to have experts whose role will be to educate us on the complicated issues involving voting methods. So instead of learning skills or trying to understand each other better as human beings, this event is intended to help us understand particular issues. You will be able to ask questions though. You can ask them while the speakers are talking or at the end. And there are two ways you can do this. First, you can use the raise hand button. This will cause a hand to appear in your box. And at an appropriate moment, you will be unmuted and can ask your question verbally. You can find the raise hand button near the center of the menu bar uh, at the bottom of your screen or inside the reactions button close to the right hand side of the menu bar. If you don't see the menu bar, move your cursor to the bottom of the screen and it should pop up. Uh, I suggest you take a minute now to find the raise hand button and give that a try. See if everybody can raise their hand. And once you've asked your question, uh, you should click on the lower hand button, which should be where the raise hand button used to be. Another way to ask questions is by typing them into the chat. And you access the chat feature by clicking on the chat button on the menu bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. A window pane will open up, then just type into the rectangle at the bottom of the pane and hit return. When asking questions, please remember to keep them concise and relevant and make sure that they're actually questions for the speakers and not speeches. So again, if you haven't already opened up your chat window, take a minute to find the chat button and open the chat. And please leave that open uh, throughout the presentation. The event hosts and speakers will put important information in there from time to time. At the end, there'll be links to, vari to various resources uh, so please be sure to stick around for that. And by the way, we're scheduled to end at four o'clock mountain time, but we're prepared to go a little over that if we get into a good discussion. Uh, another point on chat, you'll be able to chat, but only to the event host, not to each other. So use the chat for questions or comments to the organizers. And one more note on Zoom, during parts of the presentation, there will be slides or a speaker may be sharing his computer screen. The best way to see what's being shared and also see some of the other participants will be to select a side-by-side -side view, which you can find in the drop-down view menu in the upper right of your Zoom screen. And now I'm going to turn things over to Janet Sedgley to introduce our first speaker, Professor Cal Muniz. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm excited to introduce to you Cal Muniz. He's a sixth generation Montana and a native of Peaburg or Phillipsburg, Montana. He has earned degrees from the University of Montana and the University of Virginia. And currently he is an assistant professor of political science at Utah Valley University, but has done things in collaboration uh, with the University of Montana also. Um, Prior to this, he's held a postdoctorate appointment at John Hopkins University, and during the 2020 election, he served as an advisor to the Biden for America presidential campaign and served as a pollster for Senate Majority PAC and the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee in support of the U.S. Senator candidates running or Senate candidates running in Montana, Georgia, and Alaska. And in his research, he primarily studies political communication and political psychology, and he's considered a leading expert on the urban rural divide. And his scholarship has been published in some leading peer review journals in political science and psychology, while his analysis and commentary has been published by the Brookings Institute, the NIS NISCAN Center, and the Washington Post and other outlets. So I'm excited to hear what he can share with us about this topic. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks, Janet. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up uh, my slideshow that I that I have and just give me one moment to do so. Okay, can you see the full screen slideshow? Yes. Okay, terrific. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, um, hello everyone. 
And uh, as was just mentioned, my name is Cal Munis. I'm happy to be able to take part in this great event. Uh, my kudos to the Wyoming League of Women Voters, the Braver Angels Chapters of Wyoming and Montana, and to the other organizations and individuals who have worked to put this together for all of us today. Um, and so today I'm going to talk briefly with you all about the present day health of electoral politics in Montana. And um, I, I see my role today is uh, sort of being an auxiliary one to the other speaker, uh, Matthew, who was going to um, sort of go much deeper into the details of alternative voting methods, but I'll sort of set the stage with an example close to home to maybe uh, mo help motivate our discussion today. And in doing so, we're gonna cover the following ground, um, including voter turnout in Montana, electoral competitiveness, competitiveness in Montana, Montana's electoral institutions and their role that they play in Montana's ill democratic health. A, uh, and it, we're going to just sort of take a very brief foray into what can be done about this. Again, um, Matthew will be uh, covering this in much more detail. And I might give you a, uh, if we have time, um, a, a, a sort of look into a hypothetical, uh, but a realistic one, um, Tester versus Zinke in 2024 in Montana and how electoral institutions can matter in different ways, okay? Um, <clears throat> so first I'm gonna start with turnout. So turnout is the category of politics uh, in Montana that looks best overall, right? So at first glance, there's very little, if anything, to compare about, especially relative to other states. Indeed, Montana routinely boasts some of the highest turnout rates in the nation, and recent trends bear that out. For example, Montana saw 73.1% of its voting eligible population turn out to vote um, in 2020's general election that was eighth highest in the nation in the 2018 midterm election. Montana's general election turnout was fourth highest in the country. Um, however, while these numbers may look great at first glance, if we dig a bit below the surface and situate them in their proper context, we might not feel quite so cheery about those numbers and the electoral system that they correspond to. In particular, I wanna focus on Montana's primary turnout. So Montana features open primaries, meaning that any registered voter uh, we don't have party registration in Montana, so any registered voter may participate in the party primary of their choosing. In 2020, 59% of those who participated in Montana's primaries voted in the Republican primary in 2016, that was 54%. So based on those numbers alone, you might be tempted to conclude that Montana is an overwhelming re overwhelmingly Republican state and that Democrats are uncompetitive there. But uh, as we know, that's not necessarily true. The results of the 2020 election um, aside. Um, so after all, in 2018, Tester, a Democrat, was reelected with a higher share of the vote than he's ever won in a statewide contest. In 2016, former Democratic Governor Steve Bullock was also reelected. Um, but this isn't just a story about how Democrats perform much better than their primary turnout numbers might otherwise suggest. It's also a story uh, uh, for the third parties too. Indeed, Libertarian Party candidates fare considerably better in the general election than their primary numbers would suggest they would. And so this might lead you to sort of ask, well, like, why is this the case or what gives? What's going on here? And so obviously there's the possibility that a higher relative share of Democratic and third party voters show up in the general but neglect to do so in the primary. So that's a possibility, but it's, and there's probably at least something to that, but there's something else more fundamental at play here and that re, uh, involves our electoral institutions. On the general election ballot, voters can vote for, say, for example, a Republican for president, a Democrat for Senator, a Republican for House, a Democrat for Governor, a Libertarian for State Senator, an Independent for County Commissioner, and so on and so forth. But in a primary election, voters are locked into voting into one party slate. This distorts public opinion and artificially constrains voter choice. Okay, so that's an important sort of nugget to keep in the back of your mind as we move forward here. Um, what about electoral competitiveness in Montana? Uh, when we when we look uh, at 
at other uh, me metrics. So Montana is relatively competitive at the statewide level, sure, but it's dramatically less uh, competitive at this sub-state level. Um, and this is, of course, driven by a deepening urban-rural divide and an ever more nationalized politics. If you're interested in that, you can see a couple of reports that I've written for the Niskanen Center um, with uh, Dr. Rob Saldin, who's a professor of political science at the University of Montana. Um, so Republicans hold a 34 seat advantage in the Montana House and a 12 seat advantage in the Montana Senate. And interestingly, there are no independent or third party representatives in either chamber. This is uh, something that might be um, concerning or striking to those of us who know Montana well and know its independent streak well. Montana, when you look at survey data, um, tends to have one of the highest rates of people who identify as independents. Um, Montana also features, correspondingly, some of the lowest uh, numbers, uh, proportion of voters who identify strongly with one of the parties or the other. And yet, in Montana, you have no independents and no third parties that are in the state legislature. That probably has something to do with our electoral institutions. Um, a little bit more on this. So despite relatively high participation in primaries, the competitiveness of our primary elections for the sub-state wide level elections is typically worse in Montana than in the country as a whole. This is particularly um, stark in elections featuring an incumbent where in a bad year, only one in 10 incumbents face a primary challenger in Montana. In a good year, such as in 2020, that number is still a paltry uh, about one in four, okay? Um, electoral competition in the general election, this is what you're seeing here, is similarly bleak. In the past two elections, roughly one third of state legislative seats have featured no major party competition whatsoever, meaning that a candidate from one of the two parties ran unopposed in the general election. Okay, and, uh, but wait, there's more um, bad news that is, um, but even those numbers uh, don't capture just how poor Montana's elections have become from the standpoint of competition. So consider for a moment that the average margin of victory in seats featuring major party competition is a massive 27 points. The average margin of victory is 27 points, okay? And that's, right, of those elections where there actually is a competitor. We have to remember that roughly a third, up to a third of those elections don't even feature, feature any competition whatsoever. So this uh, paints a rather bleak picture regarding the democratic health of politics under the big sky, I would say. Um, and so our electoral institutions are partially to blame for this. It's not the only, they're not the only factor, of course, contributing to this, but they're one of the major factors, okay? Um, so what are those institutions that I'm thinking of here? Well, first, I'm thinking of partisan primaries, and secondly, I'm thinking of our single member plurality winner districts, and I want to focus on the plurality winner aspect of that, because changing from a single member district system to a multi-member district system, while that would probably be the best thing to do, that would also be the hardest thing to do. Um, so let's just focus on the plurality winner aspect of this. Um, first with partisan primaries, we can say that they constrain voter choice. And uh, this, so this goes back to that example that I was talking about, right? You have to choose one party primary to vote in. Um, if it doesn't matter if you really like someone who's a Democrat who's running for US Senate. If you happen to live in a place where no Democrats are running down ballot, well, you're probably gonna participate in the Republican party primary. Otherwise you're just going to be maybe, uh, you know, casting a, a, your vote for two or three offices, right? There's much more bang for your buck if you participate in the Republican party primary. Um, some people, uh, and people react differently to this. Some people will react by participating in the Republican primary. Some people will choose not to participate in the primary process altogether, right? So that's potentially bad. 
Partisan primaries also produce extreme candidates whose ideas are shared by very few voters overall. Um, and these are the candidates who run in the general election. And because they're the ones running in the general election, they're the ones who win in the general election. Okay, it's because the primary electorate is a non-representative subsample of the overall population. They tend to be more politically engaged. And because they're more politically engaged, they tend to be a little bit more extreme than voters as a whole. And those are the voters who um, people are, who, who the candidates are responding to and competing over, right? So that's potentially problematic. Um, the plurality winner aspect of this, I would say it undermines the legitimacy of our democratic system as it opens the door to winning an election, to candidates being able to win an election with less than a majority of the vote. In other words, you end up being represented perhaps, represented by someone who in fact is less than a majority of the people who showed up for, uh, voted for, right? So that's, uh, that's, that's potentially problematic. We've seen that in Montana many times at the statewide level. We also see it occasionally at the sub-state level. Um, the, the plurality winner system also produces an entrenched two-party system because voters don't want to waste their vote on a third-party candidate. So this is problematic, right? The, the poor Green Party and Libertarian Party and others right, of the world, they, uh, they would probably do much better in elections if people weren't making this calculus in their mind. They don't want to waste their vote. They don't want to potentially throw the election for the person that they like the least. So they end up voting for one of the two major parties. Um, and finally, this also leads to nasty uncivil campaigns where candidates focus narrowly, narrowly on smearing the other candidate, right? So when, party comp when, ele when elections are reduced to a two party show, right? At that point, you don't have to worry so much about alienating um, the too many voters, right? The idea is just, well, you, you just need to convince the voters and you don't have to run on your own merits. You just have to convince the voters that the other side is worse than you are, right? Um, that incentivizes um, pretty uh, nasty campaign tactics. And uh, I think that's something that we're all familiar with um, that polarizes the electorate. It polarizes the elites who eventually get into office. And it also turns a lot of people off from politics altogether. None of those things I would argue um, is particularly good for democratic health. Um, so here are a few examples from uh, 2020 in Montana. I'm gonna focus on some uh, state legislative races. Um, so first I wanna mention is Caleb Hinkle, who is the current representative of House District 68 in Belgrade. And so those of you who followed the Montana legislature at all, this last cycle are now very familiar with Mr. Hinkle, whether or not this name uh, Im immediately rings a bell. So this is the guy who brought the right to work legislation in Montana. This is the guy who uh, proposed a cons uh, an amendment to the Montana constitution to add AR-15 assault rifles to the Montana flag, so on and so forth. Caleb Hinkle is a far right wing candidate. He successfully primaried uh, the most moderate Republican in the state legislature, Bruce Grubbs. Um, but the thing is, though, that Grubbs was probably favored by a majority of the district over Hinkle. But the problem is, is that right? all the independents, all the Democrats, they don't participate in the Republican primary, right? And so Grubbs was eliminated there, right? And didn't get to move on to the general where he probably would have beaten Hinkle, right? So that's problematic. Brandon Lair is another example. Um, another far right wing candidate who successfully primaried a moderate Republican named Joel Crowder. Um, he won by a mere 150 votes out of the over 2,700 cast, faced no general election competition whatsoever. Um, nearly 6,000 voters showed up to participate in the general election in his district, meaning that over 3,000 voters never got to vote against Brandon Lair whatsoever. This is not something that, this is not an indicator of a healthy democratic system. Mark Sweeney, a Democrat in Senate District 39, narrowly won his primary against Gordon Pearson. Pearson then turned around and ran as a write-in candidate in the general election. And the election was nearly thrown to a Republican. Uh, Sweeney won by the skin of his teeth, so to speak. 
And this was in a district encompassing uh, parts of Butte and Anaconda. And if you know anything about uh, that part of the state, this is, these, this is a district that Republicans, well, should probably have really no chance of ever winning. Um, and uh, the reason that they almost won was because of our single member, our, our plurality winner single member district system where a spoiler candidate right, nearly through the election. Okay, so that's uh, just some examples of what, how this can matter. Um, what can be done about it? We can reform our institutions. There's nothing sacrosanct about them. We could do away with partisan primaries altogether, creating an open nonpartisan primary where all candidates can run on the same ballot. And then perhaps the top four move on to the general election from that. This is exactly the system that Alaskans passed on the ballot initiative in 2020. If they can do it in Alaska, they can do it in Montana, you can do it in Wyoming. Um, <clears throat> this would likely moderate our politics and increase voter turnout. We could do away with plurality winner rules, um, perhaps replacing the plurality winner system with ranked choice of voting. Um, this is something that uh, Matt's going to talk about in much greater detail. This would perhaps enhance democratic legitimacy moderate our politics, make our politics more civil, enhance feelings of efficacy amongst voters because they would know that they can vote for whoever they want to without their vote being wasted. And correspondingly, it would probably uh, enhance voter turnout, boost voter turnout. Um, and so the thing that I would say is that yes, most of this, we don't have enough data. Um, and so there, there are, you know, if you are, mathematically inclined, you can read through um, game theory and formal model literatures on this um, and mathematical proofs. But the, the, at the end of the day, there isn't enough data to really conclusively say um, that these alternative measure methods would have an effect one, you know, one way or another. Um, but what I would say that it's, un it's highly unlikely that these proposals would make us any worse off than where we're at now. So I would say, um, in other words, we don't have anything to lose, but there's potentially a lot to gain from pursuing these. And um, I'm actually a couple minutes over time, so I probably can't work through this fun example of uh, how um, voter method, alternative methods could um, influence election outcomes. But that said, um, I want to thank you for listening. If you have any questions or would like to contact me after um, this, you can send me an email at calmunis at live.com to access my report on ranked choice voting and top four primaries in Montana. You can go to my website, click on the commentary tab, and then there's a document titled A Modest Proposal to Improve Montana's Politics. So you can read that there. And I've also put this slideshow up there as well so that you can access it. And um, so if you wanna go back and read about this example of Tester versus Zinke in 24 under different scenarios, you can do so. Um, and with that, I will um, stop sharing my screen and turn it back over uh, to Janet. Thank you. And um, we will put up some of your resources at the end, just in the chat. So we'll do that. Um, but in addition, we had a question. Did you oh, say uh, from one of the people in the audience, did, did you say that voters can only vote a party line ticket? In, in well, I, I meant in, uh, in terms of when you participate in the primary, you have to choose which primary you will vote in, the Republican Party primary or the Democratic Party primary, right? And so that artificially constrains choice. Okay. And we, de we do need to move along, but also is if anybody has a burning question, um, we'll have chance for some follow-up questions near the end also. But if you have anything right now, you can raise your virtual hand or wave at me and we can check that out. But I, oh, uh, Steve. So we'll take Steve's question and then move on. So let's see. So oh, I love the uh, analysis and the solutions uh, proposed. My question, I'm in Texas. How can we get such a thing passed in Republican dominated Texas 
um, where the incentive for existing legislators is, is, is probably to do what's best for the Republican Party, not for the voters? Yeah, so this is a great question. And um, so I think your instincts on this are totally right. And so we can look to, for example, Alaska as an example. So Alaska in 2020 um, passed via ballot initiative um, uh, an electoral reform package that does both of the things that I advocate for. It replaces partisan primaries with a top four nonpartisan primary, and it replaces um, plurality winner elections with a ranked choice system in the general, okay? Uh, so, which, you know, precipitates an instant runoff, um, et cetera, et cetera. Mo uh, Matthew's gonna focus more on the mechanics of that. Um, and so they did it via the ballot initiative. And so um, I don't, I'm not particularly familiar with um, Texas and I'm not sure if you all can, if you have the ballot initiative or the referendum at your disposal, like we do um, in uh, Montana and Alaska, for example. Um, but that's one way to go against it. But to, to sort of just one more thing I would say is your instincts are totally right. And it's not just the Republican party. So Alaska is a largely Republican dominated state as well. Um, but interestingly, both political parties, the Democratic Party of Alaska and the Republican Party of Alaska came out against this electoral reform measure in Alaska. Because right now, particularly with party primaries, the, the way that the system is designed, it, un, it, it both parties love it. Um, it unfairly benefits both parties. For instance, even in a red district in Texas, right, the party primary system still advantages the Democratic Party over what it should because, like, the Democratic Party is guaranteed to place someone on the general election ballot so long as someone runs, right? That is not a guarantee that uh, third parties, for example, have because ballot access laws are very difficult, uh, are, are, uh, it's ballot access is very difficult for third parties and that whole process, including the partisan primary system altogether is certainly um, advantages unfairly the two major parties and they don't want to see that disrupted. So that's a great question, but I would say go through the initiative, but I don't know if Texas has the initiative to be uh, totally honest. I don't know either, they have a, um... We have some propositions, but I think two thirds of the legislator had to approve getting them on the ballot. So those that obviously wouldn't work. Right. Great. Well, thanks. I'll pass it back to Tom. And thank you, Cal. Uh, friend Bunker, have a question? Your hand is raised, friend. You're muted. It, yes. Uh, Cal, do you know how? long it took Alaska to implement the reform? Um, I'm not, so I think that, uh, I, I, I'm not totally certain of this. I don't believe that they had ever tried um, before 2020 to pass this on the ballot initiative. Um, uh, but I mean, obviously it was, as with any of these efforts, right, it's something that you have to start well ahead of time, certainly to, to sort of build up momentum uh, for it. So it's um, at this point, you know, if you were to want to try this in 2022, it's probably a little bit late, sure. um, but right to try that in 2024, you know, you could start now and totally, totally have a shot at that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now Nancy Lockwood is going to say a few words about the League of Women Voters and introduce our next speaker, Matthew Link. Thank you, Tom, and good afternoon and a warm welcome to everyone. I'm Nancy Lockwood, president of the League of Women Voters of Wyoming. The League of Women Voters, established in 1920, is a nonpartisan is nonpartisan, neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties at any level of government. We work to empower voters and defend democracy. We do this through education about and advocacy for public policy issues. <clears throat> 
The League has long been known for our voter service activities, most notably voters guides and candidate forums in our for, our, for our promotion of voter rights. These continue to be key issues of focus for the League. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next presenter, Matthew Link. Matthew is a member of the League of Women Voters of both Laramie and Wyoming. He is a graduate of the University of Wyoming, having just completed his master's in zoology. He views himself as a scientist first and foremost, who believes strongly in evidence supported arguments. Additionally, he has an intense interest in the political process and how voting impacts this process. Matthew brings his skills in math, statistics, and programming used in his scientific research to studying the eclectic field of voting methods, a field which draws from economics, mathematics, and engineering. Matthew first became interested in voting methods in 2016 when soliciting signatures on a petition for a third party's candidate's access to the ballot. Five years later, Following an intense self-education involving many books, videos, and even more academic articles, Matthew comes to us with the knowledge both to educate us on alternative voting methods and to steer us towards options that can achieve the voting outcomes that we desire. So welcome, Matthew. Well, thank you. Let me get my screen share up real quick here. Uh, can everyone see my slides nice and clearly here? Someone give me an audio cue. Yes. All right, great. Um, okay, so um, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, voting methods generally, uh, how, uh, why we need changes to voting methods, what the state of our system is right now. I'm going to try not to um, repeat what Cal has said, uh, especially with like his uh, um, specific details to Alaska. I'm going to try to zoom out a bit and look at more general problems in the United States. Um, and then we're going to test out a variety of alternative voting methods. Um, we've kind of uh, selected some that we think are particularly relevant and um, popular right now, and popular, popular discussion. And then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the very deep and complex field of comparing and contrasting voting methods to decide which one you actually want to use. And in the process, we're going to try out these alternative voting methods. And then so we'll run several sample elections. And at the end, we're going to see which one with each different voting method. And so um, I believe right now we're going to be uh, opening up that survey monkey link that you should have received in your emails. And um, I just want you to stand by on that poll and wait until we approach the specific method to try out um, when we want to actually test out these voting methods, because we'll give a bit of a description first to prime people for what to expect. OK, um, so uh, let's begin here. So I'm going to zoom out really far at first and uh, ask, what the heck is this thing we call democracy? So um, if we take it literally, according to the classical Greek, demokratia, it's rule by the people, right? So that's a little vague, doesn't, doesn't give us uh, something structural to define. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to define democracy as sort of a general principle. Democracy is that when decisions are made that affect you, you should participate in those decisions. That's the principle, the democratic principle. Okay, so what is the state of democracy in the United States? Well, I have in my hands, and this prop usually works a little better in person, but here in my hands, I have a landmark political science study called Testing Theories of American Politics, Elites, interest groups and average citizens by a couple of Princeton researchers published in 2014. I'm just going to go through some of the findings of this study real quick. So um, they got about uh, 1800 oppose or support public policy questions spanning two decades of public opinion polls. 
And they were able to, from this poll data, they were able to separate their respondents into a 50th percentile and a 90th percentile of income earners to establish basically what are the preferences of average, median, middle, middle class Americans versus the preferences of affluent Americans. And to this data set, they added uh, a whole bunch of interest groups, the so-called powerful interest groups. They chose groups which regularly appear in the Forbes magazine's Power 25 list, along with 10 other industries that report the highest lobbyist expenditures. So we have three variables here. And the reason, no. and, and so they took these interest groups and they used them to establish a net interest group alignment. So they just took the total number of groups supporting a particular policy minus the total number of groups opposing that policy. Okay, so we have three variables here, preferences of average Americans, preferences of affluent Americans, and net interest group alignment. And the reason this was a landmark study is because, um, they built a predictive model out of these variables to answer the question, uh, was a proposed policy change within each survey question actually implemented within four years after the question was asked? The reason this was a landmark study is because a lot of people had attempted in the past to predict the impact of some particular group in society on legislation. But this was the first to take a whole bunch of different variables and construct a model with them together to see their relative impact. So visualizing their model here, we have the preferences of average citizens, preferences of economic elites, the preferences of interest groups, and they use all three of those to predict whether a public policy is implemented in line with those preferences. So what do they find? What does their model look like? Well, it's something like this. So they found that the preferences of economic elites and the preferences of interest groups uh, have a significant predictive role on public policy but the preferences of average citizens are tiny, very tiny, uh, in terms of predicting policy. In fact, the influence is so small, it's statistically non-significant. In other words, to quote one of their conclusions, when the preferences of economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, maybe that doesn't matter as long as affluence or interest groups have generally the same views as the average Americans. Well, they attempted to answer that too. Quote, interest group alignments are almost totally unrelated to the preferences of average citizens. So this is a very indicting paper on our system. In fact, there's a word for the kind of system this describes. The word is oligarchy or rule by the few, or perhaps more specifically, plutocracy rule by money, because it's not just the interests of affluent Americans that determine policy, it's the money they funnel into powerful interest groups that determine public policy. Okay, so democracy isn't looking great. Now you might be asking why isn't democracy functioning? Obviously a takeaway from this paper is that perhaps money is involved. Um, and to be sure, uh, we've had a series of major Supreme Court decisions in the last 15 or so years, including Citizens United and McCutcheon versus FEC, that basically blew open the floodgates to unaccountable campaign financing. And uh, we have seen that the money spent in congressional races has increased with every election since then. In fact, uh, the vast majority of congressional races are typically won by the top spending candidates, which ranges from 75 to 95% of House or Senate races in the past 10 years of elections. So money does matter, but you may have heard this study referred to or alluded to by some niche independent media or something before. And there's a particular detail about this study that they always forget to mention. Uh, the detail they miss is the survey range for this study, which was from 1981 to 2002, which was long before these major Supreme Court decisions. And in fact, demonstrates that um, this disconnect between the average person uh, preferences and public policy has been around for quite some time. So I'm gonna leave that thought there and venture into 
a topic that I think is related to it. It's the topic of political parties. Um, so what is the situation of political parties in the US? As Cal has mentioned, um, and as you've probably observed, the United States is an immensely dominated by two parties, system immensely dominated by two parties. Um, mm, wow, my image isn't loading. Hold on. That's really frustrating. Oh, one second. This is an important image. I'll be quick. I love technical difficulties. Okay, there we go. Let me get my screen share back up. Mm -hmm. Okay, can everyone see this nice chart here? Give me an audio cue. Yes. All right, great. So for to get a sense of just how dominated by two parties the United States political system is and has been, we can take a look at the history of presidential elections and the vote counts attained by each candidate. And we see um, almost completely uninterrupted from 1796 all the way to 2020, there's been total domination by two parties in our elections. The few exceptions are when the Republican Party mis displaced the Whigs in the Jackson election, and when Theodore Roosevelt ran against Taft. So, uh, immense two-party domination for about 200 years. Um, and if we zero in on a particular election, you may remember that in the 2000 election, Ralph Nader ran on the Green Party ticket, and when that election was over, the media went on a blitz to demonize him as a spoiler candidate. And we saw the result of that in the next election in 2004, when uh, Bush versus Kerry saw the top two candidates get 50.7% and 43% of the vote respectively. And if we, if we zoom in on the third party share here, this little orange bar, we see that no other candidate got more than 0.38% and all the third parties combined in that election got less than 1%. So immense two party domination of our system. Okay, so why do we see this much domination? Well, what's going on here? Is it true that few Americans support or identify with other candidates? Are Americans united in our belief that Republican and Democratic Party politics represent the full spectrum of acceptable politics? Is there no preference for another combination of politics? Well, we can answer that with a series of annual polls performed by Gallup, in which they ask a couple questions. So the first is this question about U.S. party identification. So they ask people, um, you know, do you identify as a Democrat, do you identify as a Republican, or some kind of independent? And we see that we're in the middle of about an 11 year streak now in which independent identifiers um, uh, constitute a plurality of the electorates. In other words, there's more independents than Republicans, there's more independents than Democrats. Now you might be thinking, oh, well, maybe they're just special snowflakes. Maybe, they're, uh, maybe they call themselves independent, but really their politics are either Democrat or Republican. Well, we can answer that, too, with a different question asked by Gallup. Um, I'll quote this one. They ask, in your view, do the Republican and Democratic parties do an adequate job of representing the American people, or do they do such a poor job that a major third party is needed? And we see that we're currently in the middle of an eight-year streak where people who say that a third party is needed um, constitute a strong majority of the electorate. Okay, so there is a clear demand for third parties in the United States. The question is, where are they and why can't they get elected? So for that, we're going to turn to sort of an esoteric concept in political science known as Duverger's Law. So a French sociologist by the name of Maurice Duverger in the 50s and 60s observed a trend in political party dominance across a number of modern electoral republics. And then subsequent evidence and research has prompted those researchers to refer to the trend as a general law of political science. It's so prominent. So what is Duverger's law? Well, it constitutes two things. Uh, it's when you have a political body with two key features. 
one plurality rule elections, which we're all familiar with. It's the ballot where you get one option and whoever gets the most votes, whether it's a majority or a plurality of the votes is the candidate that wins. So when a political body has that, and when a political body has single winner election districts. So we're all familiar with election districts. We always have this big jigsaw of districts where one person can win. And we're always, because of that, we're always concerned about things like gerrymandering or gerrymandering, however it's said. So any political body with two key features, plurality rule elections, single winner election districts, Duverger's law says that this body will tend to favor a two party political system. So we can see a large number of countries graphed on the left here, um, graphing the effective number of parties based on votes and based on seats and comparing uh, different election systems and voting methods. And we see that these single winner plurality countries are right at the bottom left here. They're almost always effectively two parties. Okay, so um, as you may have concluded, one of the obvious cures to Duverger's law is proportional representation. So for example, if you took a bunch of city council wards, um, the way you would make this a proportional system is you would merge all of the, lord, the wards or the districts together into one big election district with multiple winners. And you would select those multiple winners based on the proportion of the vote they received in the election using some particular proportional method. Uh, and if we have a look at uh, where um, what countries use proportional representation around the world, we see that uh, quite a lot of countries do it. Uh, it's most of South America, Latin America, uh, large parts of Europe, Russia, uh, uh, about half of Africa, uh, big parts of the world use proportional representation. Now, I have a question for my viewers here. Go ahead and unmute yourself if you have an answer. Do you see any sort of trend uh, geographically on this map? Anyone, any sort of trend going on? English speakers. Mm, that is one, yeah. Uh, and also French speakers. So in fact, most of the countries that use single winner plurality, sorry, single winner elections, um, most of them are former members of the British and French colonial empires. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so that's proportional representation globally. Uh, do we see it in America? Well, yes, we do. It's found in a number of scattered municipalities around the country. Um, recently, proportional representation was adopt, adopted in uh, East Point, uh, Michigan, and uh, Mission Viejo, California. And I wanna note that it's found in municipalities in cities, but that's it, because proportional representation is a very difficult reform to get at national level and in many state legislatures due to how their constitutions prescribe the composition of legislative bodies. It's much tougher to get when you get to higher levels of governments um, and would often likely require uh, major constitutional amendments, either at state levels or at uh, federal national levels. Okay, so uh, let's, let's now we're going to focus on the meat of this talk, which is a potential other way to get at Duverger's law, get more than two parties. We're gonna talk about voting methods. So for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna define a voting method as the form of the ballot that we use, what constitutes a valid vote on that ballot, how to count the votes on your ballot, and finally, some sort of algorithm, some sort of, some sort of logical steps used to determine the outcome of the election. Now let's uh, avoid confusing, vo confusing voting methods with other kinds of election systems in this talk, uh, which are concerned with things like uh, whether you should have early voting, mail-in ballots, electronic or paper ballots, internet voting, things like that. So a voting method is about the form and the algorithm, basically. Okay, so um, now I want everyone to make sure that they have their SurveyMonkey link open. Ooh, I should probably open up an example of this to show people. Um, hmm. Yes, uh, well, we'll get to that. Um, so uh, I want everyone to have their SurveyMonkey link open in their web browser. And now we're gonna test out a variety of different voting methods. And 
Uh, when we do this in per person, we like to have people uh, with some skin in the game when they're uh, testing out a voting method. They, we want them to really think about uh, uh, a winner that matters to them. So when we do this in person, we like to bake a bunch of um, nice uh, dessert treats for people to have if uh, their particular treat wins the election. So I want you to imagine, just look at these pictures and let your mouth water for an instance here, and then think about, um, imagine when you're voting on these choices, lemon bars, brownies, chocolate chip cookies, and macaroons, imagine that um, don't just think about the choice you want, but think about the choice that might win the election, because that's the choice you're going to have to eat virtually. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start here with uh, the simplest, one of the simplest voting methods we're all familiar with. So it's plurality voting. It's also known as first past the post voting, uh, single winner voting, has some has various names. Uh, in plurality voting, you choose only one candidate, and of course, the highest number of votes wins that election. As we've spoken about previously in CalHAS, uh, plurality voting has many problems. It creates the so-called spoiler effect, which causes people to get mad at good candidates. Um, we end up with accusations like, you're wasting your vote helping the enemy. We end up with a strong incentive to support the so-called lesser of two evils in an election. Um, and this results in campaigns that are geared towards negativity because candidates, when they can only focus, when they only need to focus on one person, then they can direct all their campaigning on them and they don't need to worry about themselves or anyone else. And plurality voting also discourages good candidates from running. And the worst problem though, is that one of the worst problems is that the disillusioned voters tend to disengage from elections, resulting in low voter turnouts. Um, in fact, the United States has one of the lowest voter turnouts in uh, among all the industrialized countries in the world. I forget what we're below. It might be um, some East European country. Uh, just to get a sense of how low the voter turnout is in the United States. It's uh, in, in 2018, uh, the nationwide turnout was only 49.3% of eligible voters, so less than half. And that was the highest turnout in a century for non-presidential elections. So we have very low turnout in the United States. And of course, with plurality voting, we learn very little about the preferences of the electorate. Okay, so uh, now I'm gonna, we're gonna spend a little bit of time giving people a chance to vote on the dessert item they want. Um, so open up your SurveyMonkey links. And what I'm going to do is open it up on my computer, too, and give people a little demonstration. It's so close. That, <clears throat> that if, uh, if you haven't found it in your email, the link is in the chat at about 3.03 PM. Okay, let me just get my screen share up here so everyone can everyone knows what they should be seeing in their web browser. So here's our little voting method sampler. Remember, you select one dessert item and the winner has the most votes. I'm going to vote on mm, I'll go with uh, chocolate chip cookie. Okay, now this is important. Please wait here until we get to the next voting method. All right, so that's plurality voting. Uh, I think people have had enough time to figure that one out. Now we're going to move on to some alternative voting methods. And we're going to start with what is possibly the simplest alternative to plurality voting. It's called approval voting. So with approval voting, instead of selecting just one option on a ballot, the rule change is simple. Instead, you get to choose as many candidates as you like. And you sum up all of the approvals across everyone's ballots, and then the candidate with the highest number of them is the one that wins. So it's a very simple rule change um, that results in similar ballots, uh, ballots that are familiar to people. You just change the instructions on the ballots. 
And one of the uh, advantages of approval voting is it can be implemented on voting systems already in widespread use, including all sorts of electronic voting machines without any sorts of major reprogramming or fundamental restructuring of systems. And approval voting is also real easy to audit. All right, so we're gonna uh, open up your SurveyMonkey link and uh, let's try out the approval voting poll. Were we, were we supposed to have voted on the first one? Yeah, go, go ahead and move on to the next method now. Okay, it wasn't clear to me that we were supposed to vote rather than just watching you, Matthew. Yeah, sorry. Uh, everyone, please vote. We're collecting a bunch of voting data, and then we're going to see which one with each voting method when we're all done. So here is an example. Well, here is what you should be seeing now, the uh, approval voting ballots. So remember, you can select um, as many items as you approve of. So, you know, I'm going to say... Mm, I'm going to go with both chocolate chip cookie and brownie. Yeah, I feel like I feel like chocolate today. And I'll just wait a little bit to make sure people have time. Now, Matt, are you trying to influence our votes by talking about chocolate? I probably should not be. I probably should not be. That's electioneering. Um, I might get in trouble for that. So, uh, you know, just think for yourself, please. Come to your own conclusions about the smartest way to vote with these systems. Okay, so that's approval voting. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the history of approval voting. Um, so approval voting has been used in various places, but it was kind of forgotten for a long time in the 20th century until it was rediscovered. And one of the places it was used uh, was for about um, about 60 years in the Kingdom of Greece from 1864 to 1926. So voters would drop their balls into these uh, these devices uh, designed to uh, uh, shield people from seeing which end of the box they put it in. Each side of the box is a no or a yes. Uh, approval voting has also been used for a significant period of time to elect uh, the Roman Catholic Pope by cardinals during the Middle Ages from 1294 to 1621. And during this period, it survived all sorts of bribes, electorate modifications, quid pro quo, lies, threats, outright violence, even some murders, until finally it was repealed when the last pope elected uh, rewrote the rules. Uh, so where is approval voting used today? What do we what have we learned about it today? So like I said, it's been reinvented independently several times in the 60s and 70s. Um, and it is now currently used in straw polls to elect the UN uh, Secretary General. It's used by a number of professional societies, including a lot of ones that are very uh, math oriented, including the Mathematical Association of America, the American Mathematical Society, and the American Statistical Association. And recently, approval voting was adopted by Fargo, North Dakota for their city council elections in 2018, and by St. Louis for, I think, multiple offices in 2020. Okay, so that's approval voting. Fairly simple alternative to plurality voting. Now we're gonna jump into a really complicated one. This is the one you've all heard of by a different name before. It's instant runoff voting. So in instant runoff voting, instead of checking a box, voters order their choices by preference on ballots. And it's also known as preference voting as the hair method or ranked choice voting. But we wanna be very careful when we call this voting method ranked choice voting because instant runoff voting is only one type of ranked choice voting method. In fact, there are dozens, if not scores of different ranked choice voting methods. And we'll talk about another one in a bit here. Um, yeah. So uh, how do you select the winner with instant runoff voting? So you, we've got a ranked ballot, right? So what we do is First, we tally up our ballots according to each voter's first choice on their ballot rankings. And if a candidate has a majority of those first choice votes, then they're declared the winner and the counting ends there. Pretty simple. If, however, no candidate has a majority, then what we do is we take the candidate with the lowest number of first choice votes 
and we remove them entirely from all the voter rankings. And this causes voters' uh, rankings to bump up their second choice candidates up to first place. And so they then get their votes redistributed to other candidates, whoever they might be. And in essence, you're running a automated instantaneous runoff election, hence instant runoff voting. And then you continue this process until a candidate obtains some sort of abstract majority through it. Okay, so let's try that one out on our poll setup. Maybe I should stop. Uh, I think people generally get the idea here, but uh, let me just show you how to rank things on this one because it's a little more complicated. So you can either use the menus here to give a number to each option, or you can simply grab the options and move them around and it'll order things from top to bottom, uh, first to last. So I guess I'll go with that on my ballot. I'll give people a little bit of time to think that over. Pat, a common um, question about ranked choice voting is, do you have to rank every one or could you just put number one and number two? Yeah, so that depends on the rule you're using. Um, uh, some, some, uh, in some implementations, uh, they count these as spoiled ballots if you don't uh, rank everything on the ballot and then your ballot just doesn't count at all. And others, they um, only require like a certain number of rankings and then you can just disregard all the other candidates on the ballots. But for our purposes, um, we want you to rank all four because uh, it just makes it a little easier for us to figure out the result when everyone has a full ballot. Um, you know, ask me that question again in the Q&A because there's, there's some more to that. Okay, uh, I think we're probably feeling pretty good about that ballot now. So let's talk a little bit more about instant runoff voting. So uh, as you may have noticed, it's a fairly complicated voting system, voting method, and it requires modification of the ballot. Um, and the difficulty of counting and determining the winner with instant runoff voting, because of its complicated logical uh, algorithm, it, it expands greatly as candidates are added to the ballot. And determining the winner necessarily involves some sort of in centralization of the vote information, um, which means uh, if you're using instant runoff voting in multiple places uh, for a big office, you cannot determine the winner immediately from cumulative precinct reports on election night. You have to um, move all of that, uh, all of those ballot profiles to a central location and then run the algorithm to get the winner. And potentially instant runoff voting may invent some counterintuitive voting outcomes and new forms of tactical voting that may be undesirable. And because it's so complicated, it, it adds an extra layer of difficulty in auditing elections if you care about election security. Uh, so where has instant runoff voting been used and where does it come from? Uh, instant runoff voting was invented in the uh, mid 19th century um, and it was invented as sort of a spin-off of a sister voting method, the so-called single transferable vote or STV. Uh, STV was one of the first, if not the first, uh, proportional representation methods to see widespread adoption. So STV is a multi-winner version of instant runoff voting that selects people proportionately based on their relative support. And uh, instant runoff voting, the single winner method, is used in Ireland, Malta, and Australia. And recently it was adopted by the state of Maine in 2016, and it has just now been adopted for New York City elections in 2019. I think they're just using it for city council at the moment. And interestingly, instant runoff voting has also been adopted and later repealed a number of times in the United States, including a very interesting case in Burlington, Vermont in 2010. Okay, so that's instant runoff voting. Now we're going to move on to a different ranked choice voting method. This one's called the Borda count. So this is another ranking method. The ballot is identical to instant runoff voting in which you rank your choices according to preference. The difference is how you get your winner. 
Uh, so in board account, instead of performing this series of logical operations, um, we simply take the points associated with a candidate rank and we sum them up across each candidate. And so what we're left is with is the winner becomes the candidate with the most or the least points, depending on the scale used. So if you're using a scale where the top rank gets the most points, then the winner is going to be the candidate with the most overall points. If you're using a scale like we're using, where the top rank is a one and the bottom rank is a four, then the winner in our case is going to be a candidate with the lowest points. It's the same arithmetic, the same mathematical operations. The scales just, it can be reversed in one way or another. So let me explain that. Uh, let's, uh, let's try that out on our ballots now. Um, and let me get my screen share up. So remember, we're ranking our choices just like with instant runoff voting. Um, and except this time, uh, the one is going to represent one point on our top ranking. And we're going to sum all these together. And the candidate with the lowest number of points overall wins the election. OK, I'll let that percolate for a little bit. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the history of the board account and where it's been used. So this is another voting method that has been devised several times in history and then forgotten. Uh, one such usage was by the Roman Senate in the early second century. So this was during the empire period when the Roman Senate didn't really have any power anymore. Um, and uh, board account has also been written about by a couple uh, scattered scholars around medieval Europe. Um, but it wasn't until it was reinvented in 1770 uh, that, uh, well, it was reinvented in 1770 by the French mathematician and the naval engineer, uh, John Charles de Borda. And it was his invention of board account for electing members of the French Academy of Sciences that basically ushered in the era of voting methods science. So people had invented alternative voting methods throughout history. People had written about them throughout history. Um, but it wasn't until he came up with the board account and started writing about it and got peer reviewed by other people that it became scientific because um, people started to develop hypotheses and testing their hypotheses on voting methods. So it ushered in the age of voting methods as a science. Um, you may have heard of Borda before. He was also the guy that devised the meter, uh, the, the particular length of the meter as the basis for the metric system. Hmm. Um, and so what happened to the board account? It was used for several decades. And then Napoleon came along. He got into the French Academy of Sciences and he said, I don't like this thing. Uh, we need to make it simple again. So he got rid of the board accounts and reinstated plurality voting. Uh, so where has board account been used in modern times? Well, it's often used in all sorts of sports awards and rankings. So for example, it's used to select the winner of the Heisman Trophy in football. It's used to select uh, most valuable player in Major League Baseball, number of sports awards. Um, it's also used, it's quite common in student and administrative elections in all sorts of academic institutions. And it's used a little bit in modern governments in uh, Slovenia and a couple Micronesia nations. So it's not very popular in governments. Uh, okay, so that's board account. And finally, we'll get to the last method for this afternoon. It's uh, called score voting, also known as range voting. So score voting is very simple. Uh, rather than ranking their choices, like these previous ranked choice methods, um, voters rate their choices. So you can give a candidate some number on a rating scale. And importantly, with score voting, this means that candidates can receive the same rating as one another. For example, you could give a whole bunch of candidates the top ranking and then just leave one candidate with the bottom ranking. You can do that and more. Um, a score ballot is very flexible and provides a lot of information. And so you take the ratings for each candidate, you sum them together across the candidates, and then the candidate with the largest total score, score is the winner. So the winner selection is actually very simple to board account, very similar to board account. It's just the ballot that's different. 
And in fact, you've already come across score voting when you tried out approval voting, because approval voting is actually score voting with only two options. In approval voting, the options are yay or nay, uh, approve or disapprove, one or zero. With score voting, it's just the uh, expansion of approval voting to a finer scale. So rather than a zero and a one, you might have zero, one, two, three, like the ballot we're using. So score voting is simply a larger scale um, than approval voting. Okay, let's try that one out. So remember, if you want, you can rate two options the same on a score ballot. Maybe I'll do my ballot like this because I like, I really want chocolate today and I like them both equally. Or maybe, you know what, maybe I really, really hate macaroons and I don't want them to win anything. So I'm going to get them a big fat zero. You can do all that on a score ballot. Okay, so this is the last voting method for today. And so when you're finished doing this, click the big done button at the bottom. And that should submit the polling data for us. And, and in a moment here, um, I'm going to continue with the talk, but we're going to come back at some point and we're going to analyze all of the results from our various voting methods. Let me get my, there we go. Okay, so a little bit more about score voting's history now. So score voting was used for about 500 years in the most serene Republic of Venice to elect the city-state's leader. It was called the most serene Republic. That was actually part of its name because it was noted for being uh, one of the most, the most stable of all the Italian city-states throughout the Middle Ages and in general throughout Europe. Um, it lasted for about a thousand years or so, constantly surrounded by enemies. Uh, but uh, our friend Napoleon came by again, and uh, when he conquered Venice, he got rid of score voting along with the rest of their governments. All right, um, where has score voting been used in contemporary times? Well, you see score voting all the time, and you might not realize it. It's used frequently in judging performative sports, so things like figure skating, um, diving, gymnastics, all sorts of performative sports. Uh, judges different judges are essentially performing an election. Um, they're electing the first place winner, right? So, and second place, third place, and so on. So they give each candidate, each competitor a rating, and then you sum them all up to get their overall score and compare the overall scores across athletes. Uh, score voting is also, curiously, the only voting method so far discovered to be used by other animals besides humans. In fact, score voting is used by bees, uh, honeybees mostly, and some ants to collectively choose new nest locations. So when they're deciding to move somewhere, they use a system that is basically score voting. All right, so we've tried out five different voting methods today, a small sampling of the extreme diversity of different voting methods that people have devised. And you're you're probably wondering now, well, gee whiz, um, which one should we use? Well, the bad news is there's no perfect voting method. Uh, this has been proven mathematically by several theorems, uh, but not by the uh, infamous uh, impossible, impossibility theorem uh, from the 50s by Kenneth Arrow that if you've ever looked at voting methods, you might have heard before. Um, his theorem only applied to ranking methods like instant runoff voting and board account, but does not apply to rating methods like approval and score voting. Instead, it's this other theorem, Gibbard's theorem, devised in the 70s, which basically shows that tactical voting is inevitable outside of a dictatorship. There is no voting method without tactical voting. Okay, so we can't get the perfect voting method, but maybe we can find what are the best voting methods? How do we choose the best voting method? Um, so, if only we could read our voters' minds, if only we could probe their deepest subconscious desires, if only everyone was always fully honest on their ballots, um, maybe we could uh, come up with something perfect and consistent. But we don't know all that stuff, and hopefully never will, um, so we have to choose the next best thing. Uh, we can choose an expressive ballot which incentivizes the least amount of tactical voting. So how do we do that? So in the past, um, 
for most of its history, really, uh, evaluating voting methods, comparing and contrasting them has used a so-called criteria based approach where you establish a set of desirable behaviors that you think a good voting method should have a set of criteria. For example, will your voting method always elect the candidates that would have won all pairwise competitions when that candidate exists? This is the so-called Condorcet winner in an election. Uh, for example, could a voter get a less desirable outcome for honestly choosing their favorite candidates? This is a so-called favorite betrayal scenario and uh, some voting methods have it. Uh, for example, does a voting method, uh, does your voting method, does voting favorably for a candidate always help them? Does voting unfavorably for a candidate always hurt them? You might be surprised to learn that this is not always true. And when these two uh, criteria are put together, they form the so-called monotonicity criterion. Okay, that's a small sampling of criteria. Um, and so what you do is you determine which voting method satisfies the criteria that matters most to you. But there's a problem with this approach. The problem is it's very subjective. Um, everyone has an idea in their heads about uh, they, one person thinks their criteria are the most important, another person thinks their criteria are the most important. And there has been debates over the importance of various criteria going on for decades now. So instead, I want to focus on a different kind of approach for evaluating voting methods that was devised right around the year 2000, a so-called utility-based approach for comparing and contrasting voting methods. So now that we have powerful computers, um, what we can do uh, that we couldn't do in the past is run large simulations of elections uh, with uh, voters, candidates, and outcomes, all sorts of different voters, candidates, and outcomes. And what we can do is we can devise some sort of measure of voter happiness with the outcome, so-called utility. So a good outcome has high utility, a bad outcome has low utility. And what we can do is evaluate the impact of strategic and honest voting with different voting methods. The advantage of this approach is that it effectively combines all the information of our subjective criteria together into a single, single statistic. We can think of it a bit like uh, racing our voting methods together to see which one wins. Okay, so let's put on our math hats for a second here. Yes, we're going there. How does this all work? Imagine that we have some sort of political issue that exists on a spectrum. Uh, let's say it's, excuse me, let's say it's, uh, uh, should we tax the rich? How much should we tax the rich? Should we tax the rich a lot? Should we tax the rich a little? Should we not tax the rich? Should we give the rich our money? So some kind of issue that exists on a spectrum. Well, then we can also place our candidates in the election on that issue spectrum. They have a particular set of politics. They have a particular set of views on that issue. And likewise, we also have voters that have a particular set of politics. They can all be placed on this issue spectrum. And what we can do is we can measure the distance between our voters and the candidates. So for example, um, the red bars for the red haired guy here, um, he has a pretty similar distance between himself and this candidate and himself and this candidate. Uh, this one was the election winner, whereas this voter with the green bars uh, is pretty close to this candidate, but he's far away from the election winner. So in this particular example, we would call the candidate here, the one that didn't win, we would call this one the socially optimal candidate because it minimizes the distance, the sum distances between voters and the candidates. And not all voting methods always get the socially optimal candidate. In fact, no method gets it all the time. Okay, so how do we convert this into a statistic? Here we go. So what we're going to do is we take the sum of distances or utilities associated with the actual election winner, what the voters got, and we take the sum of utilities associated with our socially optimal candidate, what, what voters could have gotten, and we take the difference between the two. And what we end up is a statistic known as voter regret, which is basically the average avoidable human unhappiness associated with using a particular voting method in a given election. 
And what we can do then is we can run all sorts of simulations with random placements of candidates and voters on an issue spectrum. And we can compute the regrets associated with all of our simulations. And we can even compare the average regret using simulations of fully honest voters with the average regret using highly tactical voters. And what we end up with when this is all done with is a figure that looks somewhat like this. So in this case, um, the phrase Bayesian regret is basically synonymous with voter satisfaction efficiency. And all it really means is it's a measure of how often your voting method and how close your voting method gets to selecting the socially optimal candidate, the candidate closest to the sum of voter preferences. Um, so um, a couple things about this graph here. Uh, the, first, the further to the right you get, the closer you get to the socially optimal candidates. That means the more often and the closer you get. Um, and uh, if you look at the bars for each voting method here, on the right side of bars, are honest voters, simulations using totally honest voters. And on the left side of bars are simulations using strategic voters. And we see that different voting methods span different ranges between their outcomes with highly honest voting and highly tactical voting. Um, in some methods, uh, uh, we see that plurality voting has a pretty short distance. Uh, it delivers kind of the same crappy results whether you're using super honest voters or super strategic voters, not great. Um, if we look at instant runoff voting, um, we can get pretty good results when people are honest, but if people are super tactical using an instant runoff ballot, um, then we basically end up at the same result as highly strategic plurality voters. Um, another thing to note about this graph is note the distance between um, what you generally get with a random winner, as in not having elections at all, and what you have when you use plurality voting. And now note the distance between plurality voting and a method like approval or score voting. And we see that we can basically double the satisfaction in elections by switching from plurality voting to um, something like approval or score voting. OK, um, I think uh, let me just ask uh, one of our assistants here, uh, are we about ready to um, uh, analyze our election results here? Well, this is your assistant, Lynn. Uh, it's a bit of a mess. Oh. <laughs> I have the votes, but I they don't have them it. displayed in any decent way. We had a few people who didn't always vote, so the uh, data is a little dirty. We have a few, few spoiled ballots then. That's right. If it's too if it's too hard to rescue the information in them, then we can just throw those out for now. Uh, yeah, I started throwing them out. Um, I, maybe it's maybe it's best just to look at the display that's in um, um, Survey Monkey itself and interpret that. Okay, um, they do have some useful graphs in there. Um, uh, do you want to bring up your share, or should I bring up mine? Why don't you bring up yours? Let's see here. Um, let me just move to my browser here. Can everyone see my SurveyMonkey webpage? Yes. Great. OK, so we're going to go to analyze results here. I think this is where you go. OK, so um, let's have a look at our uh, plurality voting election. We saw that the winner was chocolate chip by a clear. Um, did they get a majority? Not quite. So chocolate chip had the plurality of votes at 10. Um, then if we have a look at our approval voting election here, uh, we see that, oh, we have a different winner. Mm -hmm. The winner this time was brownie. Interesting. So some voting methods can give you different winners. Um, and we see that uh, just behind brownie, um, brownie and chocolate chip had kind of similar uh, support to uh, plurality voting. But the most notable thing about using approval voting here is we get a much clearer gauge for the relative support of the other candidates that didn't win. So we see macaroons had much larger support with approval voting than with plurality voting. And I'm gonna come back to instant runoff voting uh, because I want some more time to analyze that. Uh, hmm. 
maybe uh maybe lynn actually maybe you should talk about the last couple of these while i go work on my instant runoff voting presentation okay well i'm going to call on robin for just a minute to um, uh, make a comparison to what we did uh face to face uh pre-covid okay okay so so i'm going to stop my share here um you should bring up your share and then i'm going to work on uh on my uh my little presentation for irv with my screen off robin why don't you bring up yours Okay, I'm happy to do that. We had uh, uh, a uh, uh, workshop on this um, at several cities in Wyoming in 2019 to 2020. I'm showing the results for uh, a, a, an election a presentation set like this one that was held in Laramie. So this is just for, to get for you to get an overview of some real data. And um, especially in the case of instant runoff, it's sort of interesting. So we are using the same four candidates, desserts. We are using the same five voting methods. And you can see that uh, Lemon Bars won the plurality vote. That was the first one taken. Uh, let's just note for a minute that of the other sort of simplified methods, the uh, approval count so I, I hope you can see my cursor because I've enlarged it for visibility. The approval count shows that lemon bars and chocolate chip cookies are practically neck and neck there. Uh, and But lemon bars is still winning. Now the board account, uh, in this case, we had uh, done the um, high number. Let's see, let me just check that. Yes, in the board account, we had assigned four to be the highest, the most favorable position rather than the one. And uh, so adding all those numbers up without any sort of normalization just gives us raw scores here for, for board account, raw rankings for board account. And we see that Lemon Bars is still leading. Chocolate Chip Cookies is very close behind. But notice when we get to score voting, the last method here in this Laramie case, that chocolate chip cookies actually wins. Given the opportunity to um, choose numbers, to choose assessments that might be the same across the candidates, uh, reveals that the voters really liked chocolate chip cookies collectively more than they liked lemon bars. Now let's go back to instant runoff for a second because this is the complicated method in which we look first. So I'm sort of circling this column here in a kind of awkward way, <laughs> doesn't really work. But if you look at the first round column, you can see that of the four desserts, lemon bars received uh, 12 first place votes. And, and by the way, we were all surprised at this because uh, I know a lot of people who simply don't like lemon bars. I personally like lemon bars, but lemon bars was really triumphant that night. So 12 first place votes for lemon bars, eight first place votes for chocolate chip, three for brownies and four for macaroons. Now remember how instant runoff works. We're going to drop the lowest candidate, the lowest performing candidate, and that was brownies. The three votes from brownies get distributed across the second place candidates that were on those ballots. So the second place candidates that were on those ballots uh, uh, amount three to them. three. And all of them went for chocolate chip cookies. So isn't that interesting? These three here, that number three, went to chocolate chip cookies because all of those ballots had one brownies, two chocolate chip. And remember what we're looking for here is uh, a state in which a candidate receives a majority of the vote. You can see up here that we had 27 ballots. We had 27 ballots at this little meeting. Uh, so Someone has to, one of the candidates has to achieve 14 in order to get to a winner. So in the second round, that still has not happened. So we drop another 
low performing candidate. In this case, it would be the macaroons. So the four votes from the macaroons get distributed according to their second place choice. And they all went for lemon bars. So there's some interesting political science results here. So I'm actually I'm actually ready to explain okay. our actual results in our poll okay, here. Okay, I'll just wind up by saying that it's interesting that all of the brownie people wanted chocolate chip cookies second, and all of the macaroon people wanted um, lemon bars second. So there's you know could, there could be endless PhD dissertations on that. This is a document that you will be able to receive as an example later. So let's let's go back to Matthew now. All uh, right, here we go. All right, can everyone see my spreadsheet here? Audio cue. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, all right. So, um, so we've taken the ballot data from our voters and we've organized them into all of the unique ballot orderings. So there's only so many different ways in which you can rank four candidates. And what we've done is we've enumerated all the ways that we've observed on people's ballots. So um, this particular ordering, lemon first, chocolate chip, macaroon, brownie, only one person did that. This particular ordering was a very popular one. Uh, five different people ordered brownie over chocolate chip, over lemon, over macaroon. Interesting. Okay, so um, here we go. We're going to run our instant runoff algorithm. And uh, oh, I think my number is wrong here. I'll uh, just do, do the math in our heads here. Um, no, let's not do that. Uh, so uh, first we need to figure out uh, what's a, what does a majority look like in this election? So there's 25 ballots, 25 non-spoiled ballots here. I'll say that. And uh, we're going to divide it by two. Uh, to give us 12.5, so we'll round up 13 is the majority needed to win with instant runoff voting. Do we have this in the first round? So we counted up all of the uh, first rounders here. So with lemons, for example, we had two, two, one, and one. That equals six, and so forth. We can see which ones got summed up here. Um, okay, we see that Brownie had a strong lead, but it doesn't have a majority. So we have to turn to our instant runoff algorithm. So what we're going to do is we're going to knock out the weakest of the options here, the macaroons. So just, just imagine all these, getting rid of them, they're off the ballot. Macaroons, you are toast. So they're going to have zero now, and we're going to redistribute those votes to um, whatever was behind the first or the the first rank option on these ballots. So let me get. Uh, um, oh, does this not have annotations on? Oh, bummer. Okay, well, follow my mouse then. Um, hmm. Uh, so when you knock out a candidate in a ranking, it causes all of the stuff behind it to move ahead. So we knock out macaroons here in third place, and that means brownie moves over to the left. We knock out macaroons in first place here, and that means lemon on this ordering and this ordering move to the left. Chocolate chip moves up and brownie moves up. So um, we're going to take our current totals for these, and we're going to add to lemons these two values, because in both of these ballots, the lemons got moved up to first place. Then we're going to add the chocolate chip this ballot because it got moved up to first place. And then we're going to add to brownies this ballot because that got bumped up to first place. So that's what it looks like now. Do we have a majority yet? Uh, looks like not yet. I need to fix my axes on this really quick. Let's I'll just set that to automatic. There we go. Um, so that's what our second round result looks like. Um, we see that macaroons got redistributed to other candidates. We still don't have a majority. So we're gonna do it again now. Um, this time we're going to knock out chocolate chips. So chocolate chip is gonna be a zero. So, whoops, let me visualize this clearly. So we're getting rid of all of the chocolate chips on ballots. So now it's just between lemons and brownies. We're going to redistribute those chocolate chip votes. 
So we're gonna take the currently existing lemon ballots and we're going to add to them all the stuff unlocked by removing chocolate chips. So we're gonna add this ballot here where lemon moves up to number one and this ballot here where lemon is moved from third place to second to first by the two knockout rounds. I think those are all of them. Yeah. And then for brownies, we need to add all the stuff unlocked by knocking out chocolate chips again. So we're going to add these two ballot profiles, actually these three ballot profiles, and this ballot profile. And there we have it. Um, looks like brownies won the majority. Uh, so um, if we look at, we can see how things have changed graphically here now. So macaroon got redistributed, um, and then chocolate chip got, got redistributed. So brownie is the winner overall. All right, uh, I think that's enough of that. Um, now let me just uh, finish up my talk. <laughs> let me get my presentation Now is a good up. time to clap. That was really hard. <laughs> yes, by the way, um, instant runoff voting is a very complicated method to write a computer algorithm for. Um, and that took like a whole day until I finally gave up and decided to do it manually. So uh, closing remarks and then questions. Um, so we've tried out a bunch of different voting methods. We've uh, seen some ways in which you can analyze voting methods. You can try to say which one's better than the other. Um, but uh, the reality is that the voting method community still hasn't reached any sort of consensus on the best voting method. And it's possible they may never. Uh, but we can at least say that alternative voting methods can result in more competitive elections. That's easy to say. Um, potentially, alternative voting methods can drive higher voter turnout by giving the electorate disenchanted <laughs> with the major party parties a reason to vote. Um, potentially, it can reduce campaign negativity and make candidates focus more on themselves because when you're surrounded by more than one candidate, when you're surrounded by lots of candidates that can pose a serious challenge to you, it makes more sense to put your resources into saying what you stand for instead of what all of your opponents are doing wrong. Um, and more importantly, alternative voting methods uh, allow you to learn more about what the electorate actually wants. And in terms of uh, a call to action here, uh, how do voting methods relate to making real change here? Voting method reform represents a more practical and immediate reform than full spectrum proportional representation. And most importantly, voting method reform can be generalized to all elected offices. When you get proportional representation, you have to have a multi-member body like a legislature. But when you're dealing with uh, bodies like presidencies, like governorships, mayorships, county clerks, secretaries of states, all sorts of, we have all sorts of um, official positions that are elected. Uh, we only elect one of them at a time. And you can't change the compet competitiveness of those positions with proportional representation. You have to change the single winner voting method. Okay, well, so in conclusion, um, while voting method scientists still haven't reached a consensus, there is one thing they are in unanimous agreement about. Plurality voting stinks. So um, I'm going to end here with a few resources people might find interesting. I think they're going to be posted in the chat too. Um, here's just kind of a selection of some things that I think people might find interesting. There's way more voting literature than this. But the first is a really good book called Gaming the Vote by William Poundstone. Um, whereas most voting method books uh, focus on hardcore theory and are not directed to laymen. Um, this one is, and it not only is directed towards people who just are starting to learn about voting methods, but it also analyzes a fair number of different voting methods with an even hand. Um, then there's this tool called at this particular URL that uh, can help you visualize how you get different winners with different voting methods. Um, you can actually see how the distribution and the candidates change as you move around voter preferences. And then the League of Women Voters of Boulder County in particular has put together a really excellent set of resources on alternative voting methods. And they've done they've done their own forums. They've done all sorts of things. Um, and there's a link there. And then finally, uh, 
So the Center for Election Science has recently turned into an advocacy organization specifically for approval voting. But in the past, they've done a lot of really good um, neutral, objective analyses of various voting methods that people might find interesting if they really want to dig in deep to stuff. Okay, so with that, sorry for going a little bit over time here. Um, hopefully we have some time for some good questions here. And I wonder, <clears throat> Brian, if uh, Brian Martin, if you'd be willing to moderate the questions and and also just say anything that you'd like to say. Um, I don't know who some of the questions might have been chatted to. I know that uh, yep. you know people might have been chatting them to different people in the uh, yep. among the organizers. So if if I could ask the organizers to check their chat and see if they have questions, That's and uh, I want to start with. Take that over. Um, I, um, I'm Brian Martin. I'm the managing editor of the Wyoming Tribune Eagle. And I uh, just want to thank both um, Cal and Matt for participating today. Um, many hands up for those who uh, want to appreciate their um, contributions today. Thank you so much for being part of this panel. Um, before we go any farther, somebody had directly uh, messaged Fran and asked uh, if Matt could define tactical voting. And I think Matt, you described it as strategic or tactical voting. Can you just Tell yeah, them. so it's any kind of it's any kind of dishonest voting that is used to try and game the method, trying to get a better result than you might otherwise get. That's tactical voting, dishonest voting. Dishonest voting. So using using a tactic or a strategy to yeah. So a simple tactic is, for example, maybe you were in that 2000 election and you really liked Ralph Nader for all his consumer advocacy in the 70s, but you thought. Well, he's not going to win, so I better vote for this other guy. That's tactical voting. Okay, very good. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, I want to jump back to your question, Matt, that you asked us to revisit, which was in ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting, do you have to rank every choice on the ballot? Yeah, so, um, so when you don't rank the choice, all choices on a ballot with instant runoff voting, or, or really any, okay, with instant runoff voting specifically, um, let's say uh, you rank like, you ranked two options on a ballot of four, maybe. Um, well, what can happen is maybe your ballot isn't thrown in the trash immediately. Maybe the information is still used, but if we go to some runoff elections and your two candidates both get bumped off in the runoff election, the automated runoff election, then, you lose input on the final result in the election. It's what's known as an exhausted ballot. So, um, and it turns out this is actually uh, fairly prevalent in a lot of instant runoff voting elections, and it might be a cause for concern. Okay. A lot of people throwing away potential power over the outcome by not ranking all their choices. Great, thank you, Matt. With uh, the group that's uh, watching. I've got a couple of raised hands. Let's start with, uh, I think it's Joanne Richards. Joanne, you have your hand up. Unmute for a second there. There we go. So yeah. there is a Braver Angels uh, person who has written a book um, on alternatives to ranked choice voting. So I thought that I would show it and plug it uh, since he is a Braver Angels mem member. Uh, and his author? name is Dan uh Eckham. Dan Eckham, and what's the book called again, Joanne? The book is called Beyond Two Parties. Two Parties, Why America Needs a Multi-Party System and How We Can Have It. Yeah, and it covers That's all of the systems that were just described. And we always love a good Braver Angels plug, so perfect. Exactly. Thank you so much. Uh, Dick Lane, you had your hand up for a minute. If you'll unmute and ask your question. I would like to give an example that goes to this issue of reducing negativity. The mayoral, mayoral, mayor's race in New York City had several situations where candidates were campaigning together. They were suggesting, you can decide between the two of us, but I would like to recommend that you rank the two of us someplace high on your choices. And so that would promote a fair amount of cooperative activity and positive uh, sharing. Feels like a tactic, Matt. What do you think about that? 
Well, you know, actually, what used to be an interesting feature of American elections was this thing called a ballot fusion strategy. Um, it was really common in the late 19th century, um, the early progressive era, where particularly the um, the populist party would often form. Uh, they would say they would tell voters. Um, we're going to run our populist candidates on the Democratic Party um, section on the ballot. Uh, and uh, so it, that was a thing for several decades, but then they banned it uh, towards the end of the progressive era. Um, so it's, that's actually kind of similar to forming, forming those sorts of coalitions with uh, alternative voting methods. And I think, Dick, if you were, if I remember correctly, those two were opposing the one that was definitely the front runner and they, they had a strategy to try to, to beat him. Um, good question. Thank you. Gail Simons, you have a question for Matt? Yes, thank you. So I'm significantly less concerned with tactical voting. I'm more concerned with those who don't vote at all. I'd rather have tactical voting than staying home. So uh, we know, uh, or we've, we've found data that shows that primary runoff voting takes bad participation and makes it worse. So my question is on these alternative uh, voting methods, do we have anything that shows increased participation? Um, I, I, my statement has always been two things are required for good elections, competition, and participation. Yeah, so I, I would say the participation data is somewhat mixed. Um, there, uh, so first of all, um, there's not a lot of data on methods other than instant runoff voting because they just haven't been used much in government yet. Um, but the studies that look at participation with instant runoff voting, some of them show more participation and others show actually less participation. So it's a kind of a, it's unsure. Um, I suspect there might be more participation with some other voting methods, but that's only my suspicion. Uh, there have been a lot of studies comparing participation with uh, in proportional representation systems compared to single winner systems. Um, like, uh, uh, there's a study I was looking at from uh, Switzerland a while back that showed that um, um, uh, so Switzerland has proportional, a, it's a parliamentary proportional system, and uh, they have way, they have much higher participation in elections than uh, when they did when they used a single winner system. Now, for what that's worth, okay. I think in general, oh, let me just say, in general, if you compare countries, that use single winner systems with countries that use proportional systems. There is a trend for, I think it, the actual number is like 7% higher participation in countries with proportional systems. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's something like that. Okay. Thank you, Gail, for that question. I'm gonna bounce back and forth between some folks that have put questions in the chat. And then we also have some questions for, um, for Cal. So I wanna make sure I get to these. Cal, I have a question for you from earlier in the, the presentation. Someone asked in the Montana primary, can you switch parties? In Wyoming, you're probably, you might be aware that uh, there's some controversy about Democrats being able to change their party affiliation at the prom primary election day or, and vote Republican and vice versa. Or if you're like me, non-party affiliated, you can choose, but you have to declare that by filling out a form and then on your way out, you can change it back. So uh, I think I heard you say that you can vote either ballot, but I wanted to hear what, what Montana actually does. Yeah, so in Montana, we do not have party registration at all. Um, and so um, for one of my former jobs uh, working to help get candidates elected and trying to figure out which voters we target um, to, to toward that end, it makes that process more difficult because you don't have a clear sense of who's a Republican or who's a Democrat or who's unaffiliated because there is no records kept of that. So we, you have to model it in other ways. But um, for your question, uh, what that means is that any voter can show up on primary election day and participate in whichever party primary that they so choose, because there, we have an open primary system with no party registration. 
but just to be clear, you you go in and you vote a ballot. So you're going to absolutely straight, you have to choose straight Republican yeah. or straight Democrat. Yeah, you choose Democrat or Republican yeah. Yeah. or Green or Libertarian if they happen to be on the ballot. Because there are primaries where you can go in just like the general and vote in vote for any candidate. But that's not what we're talking about here. So, right. All so, right. I'm going to go so, to Dorothy. So there's, so there's one other thing I want to note about um, runoff elections, actually. Uh, Sorry, I didn't mention it. Um, so you're talking about the participation when you use runoff elections is very low. Um, so um, I just want to note that some people think that uh, some alternative voting methods are so good, like, for example, score voting with a high range of, of expression. Um, some people think that uh, some methods can be so good that you can completely eliminate the need for having a primary election at all. You can just do one big election with a good alternative voting method, and that would almost certainly uh, increase participation and deal with that problem. Interesting. We are at four o'clock. We're gonna go a little bit past that because we've got some really good questions lined up, but we also are looking for uh, you all to weigh in on a, our question or our statement that we're going to use for the debate, which is the second part of this. So we ask you to hang with us for just a few minutes as we uh, get to that. Let's go to Dorothy, who had her hand up for a little while. Okay. My question is that, I, and I go with Gail about wanting to know, um, did this, in wherever it's been used, increase uh, voter participation? Because being somewhat visually challenged mm -hmm. myself, I have, um, I, I couldn't see the, I could see the charts, but I couldn't see the, the writing on the screen. And they all seem to depend very heavily on being able to read and use a computer. Um, do, is there a large print version? <laughs> I, I, I think it would cause voter, my just gut feeling would be, it's way too confusing for the average voter. And uh, I would discourage people who had some handicap. I, I really think you'd find handicapped people saying, this just doesn't work for me. Uh, if you can see it, you can read it and do it. But if you can't see it, you can't do it. So are you asking about um, what might be the participation impacts of varying complexity of ballots, basically? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good point. Um, uh, I do know there's been some studies on, on the scale for score voting, which surprised even me. Um, they've done, uh, they've done a bunch of polling to ask people, uh, what would be your preferred scale when using score voting? And you might think, well, let's keep it simple. We don't want too many possible ratings for people to decide upon or to clutter up the ballot with all these options. Um, you, but, might, you might explain but, what you mean by scale first. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so with score voting, you can have different scales, right? You can have uh, rate, rate someone from one to two, one to three, one to 10. Uh, you can do zero to a hundred. There's all sorts of different uh, the the grain the fineness of your scale can be altered with different types of score voting well anyway um and this i don't know how much this applies to other voting methods but um they've done there's been various studies on what would be the optimal scale for score voting and surprisingly um people are generally fine with a scale from one to ten or zero to nine which seems to me like wow that's way over complicating the ballot but people actually seem to prefer a scale that large compared to something like one to three, uh, one to five, et cetera. Now, I don't know how much that applies to handicap accessibility, but that's just something to think about. Sounds good. I want to, uh, we've got a few folks that have dropped off and before we lose too many more, I'd like to talk to or have the um, co-presenters decide if they want to do the poll right now because we do have a poll. Janet's nodding her head yes, it was Chris. So we're going to ask you to weigh in with us on this poll. So watch for this to come up. What we're looking for is for you to um, help us decide what the resolution will be that we use for our upcoming debates. So 
The question you can see on your screen, you should be able to see that now. What voting methods would you like to include in the upcoming debate? And it is multiple choice. So you can pick any of the five voting methods that we that Matthew talked about today, plurality, instant runoff, Borda, approval, and score voting. So please mark your preference there. We've got a little bit of time there. We'll keep the poll open, but um, I wanna make sure that you uh, include, get your choice mentioned, and then we wanna make sure that the, by plurality, the uh, most popular choices will get included in our debate. And we'll talk about how that debate's gonna happen um, in a minute. So would you say you're performing an approval voting poll? We might be doing an approval. You're allowing multiple choices? Hmm. Yep, that's that's I was thinking. I like that, <laughs> absolutely. Let's go ahead and do some other questions while you're voting. I wanna make sure that, that we get to a couple other questions. Um, I want, and either one of you or both of you could, could weigh in on this, Matt or, or Cal, but uh, what do you think about the runoff method that's being considered by the Wyoming legislature? And would instant runoff be a better method? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, well, I'll elaborate on that. Um, so there are some systems that include instant runoff voting with uh, another runoff election. Um, I think there's certain places in Australia that do it like that, not for their house, but for more local offices. And I'm not sure that it actually, um, I guess the question is, what's the goal of doing that? Uh, actually, I think I've I missed the question because wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. The way the no, the what the Wyoming House is considering is replacing the runoff election with instant runoff voting, or they had been considering it. So, so let me sorry. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that can totally be done. Um, the question is, uh, is, uh, is instant runoff voting good enough to remove whatever um, benefits you might get from a runoff election? And honestly, I don't see a whole lot of benefits from runoff elections in general. Um, systems that use plurality voting with runoff elections, including France, like the French presidential elections, uh, they, ha they have two party domination. Um, so it doesn't seem to be dealing with that issue when you have a runoff election. And as, as uh, someone else mentioned, it decreases voter turnout because people have to vote twice. Um, so I'd be all for replacing a runoff election with some kind of alternative voting method especially if it's a really good one. <laughs> Sounds good. Cal, any thoughts about runoff, general runoff elections? And does Montana use them? No, Montana does not use them. But um, my general thought is that if, uh, yeah, I, I share Matt's opinion that um, a runoff election is not, necessarily desirable because of the issue of having to hold an entire another election again, which invariably leads to de decreased voter turnout. Instant runoff is much preferable to the standard runoff election because, well, it's all, it's, it's right in the name. It's done instantly. It's all done in one shot. You rank the candidates one time and you cycle through the rankings until you have a majority winner. Um, so you don't, you don't have that drop in turnoff um, that, or in turnout rather, that you get from um, holding a runoff election. So um, mm -hmm. that, that's that's where I come down on it. One thing I'll one thing I'll add to that is um, uh, if you go to California, they have this thing called a jungle primary, where they allow anyone from any parties to be in a single primary, and then they just pick the top two, and they have a runoff election between the top two. Well, what happens there is. It doesn't just lead to two party domination, it leads to one party domination because it's always Democrats versus Democrats. Mm -hmm. And there might be some pros or some cons to that. I don't know. Gotcha. Let's go to uh, Harriet. Harriet. I actually have two questions. One, uh, Matt, you keep talking about how complicated ranked choice voting is, but really I think you have to differentiate between the process of voting and the process of tabulating the votes. People rank things in their everyday life every day, and it's not very hard. And in fact, for a lot of people, it's easier to do that than to come up with the single candidate to vote for. 
and in terms of how difficult it is to to calculate it, it's something that takes time. It's not complex, but it does take time. So I really think by your continually repeating how complicated it is, it's really misleading. So that was my first point. And my second point is on approval voting. I don't really, I didn't pay enough attention to you, your utility chart to understand it. But when it comes to tactical voting, it's my understanding that approval voting, which is primarily used in on college campuses and in uh, professional organizations, it's it's really only once been used in Fargo in a public election. But that is the most tactical voting option because people bullet vote. I don't want if I have a favorite candidate, I'm not going to give everyone else a shot at it. So I just vote for my favorite candidate. And my understanding is that that's quite common. So those are my two points. Would love to hear your feedback. Yeah, so it actually turns out, first of all, that bullet voting isn't very common in real world use with approval voting. It's definitely what you can do to game an approval vote ballot. But the thing is, all sorts of alternative voting methods, including instant runoff voting, have tactics you can use. And it's not, the question shouldn't necessarily be, um, can you use this tactic with this particular voting method? The question should be, what's the impact of tactical voting with this particular voting method? And it turns out that the impact of tactical voting with approval voting is actually pretty small compared to voting honestly. When you when you look at the, the sum outcome of elections with approval voting, it's surprisingly small. In fact, it has, probably next to plurality voting, it probably has one of the smallest ranges between the outcomes between honest voting and tactical voting, which is a very surprising property given how, what a simple voting method it is. Good. Before we get to the next question, I just wanted to note, uh, Susan Simpson put in the chat, if you didn't see it, that Wyoming has disability considerate machines, including having ballots being read aloud to slightly impaired voters. So. Back to Dorothy's question there, there are so, ways to, to help out with that. So. Yeah, I don't think I answered her first question. Um, in terms of complexity, when it comes to a voting method, the, the complexity of dealing of getting a winner. Um, so what, what is that impact in terms of practicality? Um, there's several potential impacts. One is that uh, the complexity makes it harder to audit an election. Um, for example, uh, I think Cal talked about this a little bit too. Um, he introduced this concept of the margin of winning, the margin for winning, right? That's what it's called. Margin of victory, margin of victory, which is basically the number of ballots that need to change in an election to change the outcome of the election. And it, it turns out there's actually a big problem with certain complicated voting methods like instant runoff voting, all sorts of Condor say methods, which we didn't talk about today. Um, all sorts of voting methods with complicated logical rules for getting to the winner. Um, they are known as NP hard in terms of getting the uh, ascertaining the margin of victory, which basically in computational complexity theory means that they're among the hardest possible problems to solve in terms of optimizing a computer algorithm. The more voters you get in an election, the more candidates you get, the, those particular voting methods Figuring out the margin of victory on them expands exponentially the complexity to it. And the problem with that is um, you need to be able to figure out the margin of victory when you're auditing an election in order to determine um, how many votes needed to be flipped, uh, how much electoral fraud was necessary in order to change the, the outcome of the election. So it's actually a, it's, a, it's kind of a, an under, um, under discussed problem um, in property of voting methods that's only recently been addressed. Okay, sounds good. Um, Lindy Kirkbride, another question. Um, I, Matt just got, uh, talked about it a little bit, but I wondered what, to increase voter participation, what methods are gonna be calculated as most secure and increasing voter confidence. And that it's, you know, what is, what, who's gonna be complaining about what and how long the, will it take to, to find out 
the validity of an election with the different methods. Yeah, so any voting method in which you simply sum up a set of numbers to get the winner, those are really easy to audit. Uh, so board account, score voting, approval voting, um, you don't need to centralize your, da your data to run some algorithm on it. You just sum numbers up and the highest number is the winner. Um, in terms of protection against, well, we could just say simplicity. Simplicity equals security when it comes to elections. Um, generally. Uh, so you would say that plurality voting and approval voting are probably the most secure voting methods. Now, we might need to interrogate other criteria for selecting voting methods than that. I'm going to take one more question and then we're going to wrap up and I've got Margie Griffith uh, lined up to ask the, the last question. Thanks. I thought maybe putting my picture up might help. <laughs> um, I had two, actually, um, Matt, if you could put up the chart, and you've talked about it, where the y-axis is simplicity and the x-axis was maybe acceptability, something like that, um, they were red blocks, and you were just kind of talking about that. I, I wondered if you could just put that up again. And then yeah. my question relates to primaries. My concern about party primaries at this point is we seem to end up with the most, oh, I thought they were red, they're blue. Okay, uh, um, is that we seem to get our extreme party people in the general election um, because we have lower primary turnout. And so, uh, you know, the voting method thing doesn't really address that problem, which I think is also a huge part of our political process today. And I don't know whether you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, that all depends on what you mean by the word extreme. Um, I would argue that okay. most of the candidates we have today in our two-party system are rather extreme, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, in the sense that they don't seem to care about a wide variety of issues that have majoritarian support in society. So. Some examples, um, there's widespread popular support for a single payer Medicare for all style healthcare system, both among Democrats, independents, Republicans, widespread majority support. Um, there's been widespread majority support for a long time about legalizing cannabis, yet we don't see, uh, uh, oftentimes you need some sort of ballot initiative to get movement on that. Um, there's widespread support for uh, decreasing college tuition, yet that hasn't gone anywhere for ages. It just keeps going up. Um, so uh, can you get, so let me put it this way. Um, yeah, looking at this graph, uh, when you elect a candidate that is closer to the sum of voter preferences, you're going to get someone that is uh, more of like a, uh, you could call them a true centrist in the sense that they actually represent the views of the electorate. Um, whereas we don't really have centrists right now. We have, I don't want to use the word right or left wing. We have uh, representatives that um, have views that are quite far away from the electorate. But some, but vo oh, so anyway, um, so voting methods to the right on this graph will tend to elect those particular candidates, those centrist candidates more often. They are less extreme. In fact, I think uh, the, the word often used to describe approval voting in particular is it's like the, um, it's like the median voting method. It tends to select um, moderates. Yeah, I'll put it that way. But it, would that be true with party primaries? Because it still seems like the most active political people tend to be the ones with the more extreme views in that in each party. So we end up with the far left and the far right in the general. And I'm not sure that changing to approval voting would change that. So you're saying using approval voting along with while keeping a party primary? Well, I. I don't know. That's, I think that's what I'm, I mean, I, I think California's system is interesting, but like you say, you end up with just, um, you know, two Democrats. Can I jump in here for a second? Of course. Please, yeah. 
Yeah, so in the report um, that I wrote with Dave Parker at MSU, um, this is why we recommend not just getting rid of plurality elections, you need to also disrupt the primary process as well. Um, and the problem with California, as Matthew mentioned, is it's a top two system, which tends to effectively be just another democratic primary. Um, and so uh, ideally what you would have is not a top two system, but a top four system. So that's what we recommend. You send the top four candidates, and then let's say in any of these different scenarios, instant runoff or approval voting, this changes the incentive structure for candidates now, right? Because now the candidates need to compete in the case of instant runoff ranked choice voting, they need to compete for the second and third place votes of the voters, right? And in order to credibly, or, you know, in order to maximally compete for those voters, you probably do need to moderate your position somewhat. You can't be, you know, uh, some extremist firebrand and hope to em emerge as a winner in an instant runoff ranked choice voting system, right? If you're competing against three other candidates, maybe that's, maybe you're a Republican who's competing against two other Republicans and a Democrat, or you're a Democrat competing against, you know, another Democrat and two Republicans, right? That you need to moderate, you need to appeal to people across the political spectrum if you hope to win in that system. So that's why we recommend um, replacing partisan primaries with a top four nonpartisan primary to determine who the four candidates are um, who will be ranked in a instant runoff ranked choice voting system. So Might in California, they end up with three Democrats and one Republican or four Democrats? Yeah, perhaps, but right, um, that would still be preferable um, to having, right, just two Democrats uh, okay. slugging it out. Um, in California, I think is somewhat of an outlier in terms of its underlying yeah. political composition. Most states are in fact, more purple than uh, California is, for example. So some of what I heard in Margie's question, though, was about moderating candidates and getting away from the political polls, the, the far right, far left. Yes. And I'm wondering if, if Matt or Cal or both of you could talk about if we move to, let's say we move to approval or score voting, you're talking about doing that in the primary as well as in the general, right? So even in the prime within the primary system, if you're using approval voting, the the candidates the all the democrats all the republicans are going to face that same they're not they're not plurality um, voting methods they're using approval so they can't just instantly appeal to that base if you will except if you if you have only the if you have far fewer voters coming out for the primary that may not work as well it's it true. seems to be true what do you think well, the big impact of adopting one of those voting methods in the general election is <clears throat> any good alternative voting method in the general election is it's going to make third parties more competitive in them. And so it, it may be the case that um, you don't need to worry so much about what's coming out of a party primary because there's going to be a nursery effect, an incentive for having more than two serious political parties. So whereas right now um, we do so much tactics and uh, so much so much politics happens in the party primaries because those are the ones you're going to end up competing against one another in the general election. Mm -hmm. um, if you adopt a good voting method in the general election, um, the emphasis is going to be taken off party primaries a fair bit. Very good. No, I don't. I don't see that because. So let's say the primary let's, determines the candidate. Yeah, this for is, the party. This heads into a debate, which is a good segue into our next event, which is happening <laughs> November fourteenth. Uh, save that, Margie, because I think you'd be a good debater for this. Um, oh, we're going to okay. talk a little bit about. We're going to talk about that format here in just a second. But okay. um, I'd you. encourage you, those who still have questions, to ask those questions in the chat. Um, we'll we'll continue. We've got a, a couple of quick 
um, commercials or talk about Braver Angels really quickly, but I know our experts can watch the um, the chat. If you've got some questions you'd like to ask them, they probably would, would respond to that. Um, I wanted to take just a second and, and explain to you why the Wyoming Tribune Eagle and myself as the editor is involved in Braver Angels to begin with. Those of you who are not new to, to these programs know that this is one of several that the Wyoming Tribune Eagle has been involved in, and, and I'm especially excited to have uh, League of Women Voters join us along with uh, Braver Angels Montana and Wyoming in this. And I think it's just a great opportunity to say that Braver Angels, like League of Women Voters, is a nonpartisan organization. The goal is to encourage and teach people how to have uh, productive conversations to set aside those those political views and to understand that even though you have those views and you're going to uh, hold on to them, you need to be open-minded to and learn how to have those conversations and engage in productive dialogue. So uh, I connected with Braver Angels, uh, oh boy, I don't know how long ago it was, Tom, but um, several years ago now, two or three years ago before the um, like 2018, 2019, and we've sponsored a few events now, and I'd like to see more people involved in that. But um, for me, it's an opportunity. The reason I'm a Braver Angels member and contributor is that I believe in the mission of Braver Angels, which is to encourage people to um, sit down and have productive dialogues. So um, I'd encourage all of you to join. It doesn't cost very much. I think it's like 10 or $12 a year, and then you can choose to give more beyond that. But uh, go to braverangels.org and check that out. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to, to uh, Tom and, and Chris and let them explain the format for the debate because they know the format better than I do. Thank you all for being here. Oh, gosh. Okay. I'll take that on, Tom. Um, the Remember, uh, Braver Angels debates are different than your high school sort of debate. These are more uh, collective um, conversation to understand more about different views. So the whole point is not to change each other's mind, but to change, build understanding, uh, understand the nuances of various things. Of course, this debate um, isn't necessarily a, a very polarizing one that I know of, we may be surprised. But again, it's highly moderated. You don't need to be an expert. You don't need to be prepared. What's really nice about these style of debates, what, what we do is we have four people, two opposed to the resolution and two for, um, who are more prepared and they kind of outline the basic um, points on the debate resolution from their perspective. At each, after each speaker, there are questions from the participants um, so for understanding um, further. And then after that, it's open to anybody in the audience. And those are often the best comments and questions and debates. Um, you don't need to have a lot of facts, uh, although facts are nice, um, but it's a dialogue between each other and it's highly moderated and there have been very, very con contentious topics that have um, been able to bring people to better understanding out about each other. And yeah, sometimes we change our mind, but that, that's not the whole point. It's to understand um, having civil dialogue is critical to repairing our democratic republic. So. Uh, with that, I don't need to put the pitch on for Braver Angels because Brian already did it. But one of our sayings is we're trying to build a house united. With that, I'll turn that back to Brian. Great. Thank you, Chris. And uh, we're gonna be using the poll results. We didn't show those, but we I can tell you that um, ranked choice voting or um, what, did, what was the other title for that, Matt? Instant runoff voting. Runoff voting was uh, definitely one that people are interested in. So the Braver Angels planning team will be working on a resolution and we've got a couple of ideas already, but we'll, we'll have a resolved statement and then we'll work from that. And then as Chris described, there'll be uh, opportunities to debate um, for or against that resolve statement. So we hope you join us uh, Sunday, November 14th from two to 4 p.m. Uh, for that debate. And the uh, link to register for that was in the chat. Um, somebody already posted that. I appreciate that, Janet. 
Um, it is uh, the tinyurl.com. It's BA Voting Debate. So please go online and register for that, and that'll get you the Zoom link for that program. Brian, may I interrupt real solution. quick? I was wondering if if any of you have um, strong feelings or uh, feeling like you would like to be one of the first four speakers in the debate. Do let us one of us know because that's what we're looking for is for um, four people to start off with. Thank you. Yes. So please put your uh, put put that in the chat for us if you were interested in being one of our first four speakers at the debate. That would be super helpful. Any other last comments, statements, planning team? Seeing everybody there, I think we've had an incredibly successful event. I wanna again, thank um, both Matthew and Cal for their help, uh, for their insights, and hopefully you all gained a better understanding of voting methods, that was our goal. And so we, we thank you for participating. Thank you for educating yourself and um, I'm always uh, interested in encouraging people to be active. Tell your elected officials what you think uh, about what you learned. Tell them what your preferences are, because if they don't hear from you, they're gonna do what they're gonna do, um, maybe without an educated perspective. So um, we've heard a lot of people say these, these runoff elections aren't necessarily gonna be the best options. So you can say, I went to a Braver Angels League of Women Voters event and I learned that this this type is better so consider that hope to see you all on the 14th thank you so much for joining us bye everybody thank you everyone thank you and those of you who are part of the planning if you don't mind staying after maybe we could take a quick break but do a quick 